This is a little uh, extra supplementary video. If you're having trouble with valence bond theory, called valence bond theory for dummies. Here's where I show you how to actually, you know, identify what kind of hybridization is present, what kinds of bonds are present, without really understanding deeply what's going on with valence bond theory. And as you do more and more problems, I think the understanding will, will come. Sometimes that happens that you sort of uh, fake it until you make it. So here's how we can recognize what type of hybrid orbitals are present. This is one of the sorts of questions that you're going to be asked on the AP exam, almost certainly. First thing to do is draw the Lewis structure of the compound. And I don't mean just a skeleton. I mean completely draw the Lewis structure. Then look at that Lewis structure, just like if you were doing VSCPR theory, and count the regions of electron density around the atom that's in question. And regions of electron density mean double bond, single bond, triple bond, or lone pair. Just like in VSEPR theory, each one of those counts for a region of electron density. The number of regions of electron density tells the hybridization of the atom, and you can sort of just count uh, by S's and P's and D's. I mean, if you have two regions, it's SP. If you have three regions, it's SPP or SP2, and so on. So here's a little chart that summarizes two regions, one, two, SP. Three regions, one, two, three. SPP. Four regions, SPPP. Five regions, SPPP, and then you're out of P's because there's only three P orbitals, and so then you have to go to D for the fifth one. And SP3, D2, one, two, three, four, five, six regions. And then the shapes, well, they're the shapes that you know of from the VSEPR theory. Let's look at a few examples. So I'm just going to grab some random molecules. There's ammonia, uh, PCl3 and xenon tetrafluoride. Let's just do these three. So the first thing you want to do is draw a Lewis structure for ammonia. We've done this one before, so I'll shortcut the process. You end up with bonds to three hydrogens and a lone pair on the nitrogen as well. Uh, there are three chlorines. That's going to give you 21 electrons. And then phosphorus is in column five. So that will give you five more. So this structure should have 26 electrons in it. If I put phosphorus in the center, surround it with three chlorines, and fill octets, each chlorine has got six electrons around it in lone pairs. So with three of them, that makes a total of 18. So the bonds are 20, 22, 24, and that means we need an extra lone pair in the middle. Xenon tetrafluoride. Xenon gives you eight. Fluorine gives you seven times four, seven times four is 28, and so this structure should have 36 electrons when we're done. Put the xenon in the center, surround it with the halogen, which typically is on the outside with making one bond, and then if I fill the octets on fluorine, it's six each, so six times four is 24, and then with the bonds, it's 26, 28, 30, 32 electrons. Not enough, so I have to put the remaining four electrons on the central xenon atom in pairs. Okay, let's go back to ammonia and identify what is the hybridization present. Well, I look at ammonia's Lewis structure and I see four regions of electron density. The lone pair is one, each of the bonds is another. So since I have four regions of electron density, I'll just count out what this hybridization has to be. S, P, 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 or SP3 hybridization. What would that look like for nitrogen? Well, the nitrogen would have to have four SP hybrid orbitals, and the lone pair is in one of the hybrid orbitals, and then overlap with hydrogen atoms, 1S orbitals come in the other three SP3 hybrid orbitals. Looking at PCL3, that central phosphorus has got four regions of electron density around it. So once again, I have SP3 hybridization. S, P, 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 if I'm counting them up. So it's the same story for the hybridization in phosphorus as it was for ammonia. Now let's look at xenon tetrafluoride. Looking at the central xenon, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six regions of electron density. So counting up, S is one, three P's gives me four, I need two more, so I go to the D's, SP3D2, so you just count up. 
and you can identify the hybridization that's present. Let's look at a couple more. Do NO3 when minus and HCN. To have the Lewis structure for NO3 when minus, I have a, a resonance situation. So I'll make the double bond there. It doesn't really matter where I do it. And the nitrogen doesn't have a lone pair. This oxygen's got two lone pairs. Oxygen on the top has got three lone pairs, as does the oxygen on the left in this structure. So what's the hybridization? Well, I'm counting around nitrogen three regions of electron density. S, P, P, or SP2 hybridization must be what is taking place. That's for the nitrogen. What's the hybridization on the oxygen? Well, this oxygen has got three regions of electron density as well. So that's SP2 hybridization too. The oxygen on the top and the oxygen on the side will also have four regions of electron density. So those are SP3 hybrids. Let's look at where the electrons are arranged. In the SP2 nitrogen, I have one bond formed to an oxygen, another bond formed to another oxygen, a third bond formed to a third oxygen, and that's where my SP2 electrons are. But I have an unhybridized 2P, and that's also got an electron in it. That's what's going to be making the second bond to that oxygen. Over here, this oxygen has got sp2 hybridization as well, but it's got two lone pairs. So two of these sp2 hybrid orbitals have lone pairs in them, and then this orbital makes the bond with the nitrogen. That also keeps an unhybridized 2p on that oxygen, and that unhybridized orbital is what causes the second bond to be formed. So here's our overlap. There's a bond there between this orbital and this orbital. And the second bond, the pi bond, is between those two orbitals. Now this oxygen on the left is sp3 hybridized. So that means four hybrid orbitals. Three of them have lone pairs. And one doesn't. And it's the one that doesn't that makes overlap with the nitrogen sp2 hybrid orbital and makes a bond. And then the same thing is going to be true for this oxygen up on the top. It's going to make the same kind of overlap. The other type of question that you're going to be asked about on the AP exam is how to identify the sigma and pi bonds that are present in a compound. Again, draw the Lewis structure if you haven't already or don't have it given to you. Every single double or triple bond contains one sigma bond. Every bond has a sigma bond in it. For a single bond, that's all that's there. A double bond has a sigma bond in addition to a pi bond. A triple bond has two pi bonds and a sigma bond. So here are some mis miscellaneous notes. First of all, pi bonds are always formed by the overlap of unhybridized orbitals. Usually this means unhybridized p orbitals. Occasionally this could mean d's. If you have lone pairs in a Lewis structure on the central atom or on any atom, they're always found in hybrid orbitals. They're not found in unhybridized orbitals. So what bonds are present? Let's ask, answer that question. Well, any place you have a single bond, you have a sigma bond. So there's a sigma bond there, there's a sigma bond there, and one of these two bonds is a sigma bond on axis. Anytime you have a double bond, you also have, in addition to the sigma bond, a pi bond. Let's do HCN, draw the Lewis structure. Carbon's got four electrons, nitrogen five, hydrogen one. So this gives us a total of 10 electrons in the structure. I'll attach nitrogen, hydrogen here, draw on this Lewis structure before. To get 10 electrons, we know we end up having to triple bond to the nitrogen. So what's the hybridization? Well, hydrogen doesn't hybridize. Carbon here has two regions of electron density. So carbon's hybridization here is sp hybridization. So what does that look like? Carbon's got two sp hybrid orbitals, which leaves it with two unhybridized 2ps. None of them have lone pairs. There's a sigma bond, 
with overlap there and a sigma bond there. Carbon has four electrons in its valence shell, so that means the other two electrons must be in two p unhybridized orbitals. Let's look at the nitrogen. The nitrogen also has two regions of electron density, so it is also sp hybridized, meaning here's here are the locations of nitrogen's five electrons. Three of them are in sp hybrid orbitals. One is a lone pair. Lone pairs always go in hybrid orbitals, remember. And the other one is overlap to make the sigma bond. So overlap here and here makes the sigma bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. Well, that leaves two unhybridized 2p electrons. One of them makes the first pi bond between carbon and nitrogen, and the other one makes the second pi bond between the carbon and nitrogen. So what's the bonding type? Well, there's a sigma bond here, and that's overlap between this hybrid orbital and the 1s on hydrogen. And there's a sigma bond here, and there are two pi bonds between carbon and nitrogen. This example is asking, what's the hybridization in all atoms in the sulfate ion? And this is going to give you an opportunity to stretch your brain a little bit, maybe get a deeper understanding of what valence bond theory is all about. Sulfate ion, remember, is SO4, 2 minus. So let's go to a bigger workspace and draw the Lewis structure and then think about the hybridization of the sulfur and all four of the oxygens in the sulfate ion. So we're drawing a Lewis structure for sulfate, first of all. If you're not thinking about formal charge, the structure that you'd get would look like this, uh, but that's not the best optimum Lewis structure because formal charges are negative ones for all of the oxygens here. <clears throat> and uh, formal charge on sulfur is 543 plus 2. So we could make a better Lewis structure by making a couple of double bonds to O's. And this actually turns out to be optimum because we now have the formal charge on sulfur down to zero formal charge on the oxygens is zero in two places, but negative one only in two places. Now, what's the hybridization? Let's look at the central sulfur, first of all. Sulfur is making four sigma bonds. That means it must be hybridized in a way that gives it four orbitals for overlap, and that's sp3 hybridization. Since each one of these is making a sigma bond, we have to have one electron in each one of these orbitals. But sulfur's got six electrons. So where are the remaining two electrons? Well, they must have moved into unhybridized d orbitals. <clears throat> so here is our 3d sublevel, and two of the electrons are present, according to Hund's rule, in two separate orbitals. So overlap here with an oxygen hybrid orbital is going to give us a sigma, this will give us a sigma, this will give us a sigma, and this will give us a sigma. Now in these three Ds, I'm going to have a pi bond form here and a pi bond form here, and that's the basis for the two second bonds to the two double bonded oxygens. Let's look at oxygen next. <clears throat> First I'm going to take a look at the case of the double bonded oxygens. Our double bonded oxygens have sp2 hybridization because they have three regions of electron density around them, sp2 hybridization. Two of them contain lone pairs, and one of them provides overlap to make a sigma bond with a hybrid orbital from the sp3 hybridization in sulfur. So I'll kind of trace that out. This orbital and this orbital make one of the sigma bonds. And of course we have a second oxygen just, just identical to this that's using up the next one and that makes another sigma bond. But that's not all the electrons that are in oxygen. Oxygen has six electrons. And there are only five of them accounted for here. So that sixth electron must be in an unhybridized 2p. Unhybridized orbitals are what make pi bonds and so this is going to make a pi bond. What's the bonding? 
well, this electron and this electron are the ones that form that bond, and so that overlap occurs there. This electron in the, third, in the other 3D orbital makes the second pi bond to the second oxygen atom that's identical to this one that we have here. Now let's take a look at the single bonded oxygens. These have four regions of electron density, so they must be sp3 hybridized, just like the sulfur. <clears throat> so that means all four of the s and p orbitals are gone now. They've been hybridized. And three of these orbitals are going to contain lone pairs. Now here's a sort of a dilemma. There's another electron that has to go in here to make the sigma bond. But we've already used up all of oxygen's six electrons in the three lone pairs. Where does that other electron come from? Well, the answer is it comes from the 2 minus charge. When this ion was formed, somehow it gained two extra electrons. And one of them goes here, and the other one goes in the same orbital in the other single bonded oxygen. So this will form a sigma bond. And then the other identical oxygen, single bonded oxygen, will have another orbital just like this, and that will form the second sigma bond. So here's our bonding to the single bonded O's, overlap from there and there, makes a bond, and then there's another identical O that gets this other one.